Hello, thanks for joining me on The Wine Road again today. In my previous podcast, there was a French theme. Today, Spain and Portugal will be addressed, this time from Napa Valley. Let's hit the road. We make 28 different wines at Artesa. So we, Ariane's are really, I mean, our focus is obviously on um, Pinot and Chardonnay, but we also have a, a very large wine club, and so we really cater to them and to these wines that they really love. If you like a woman who is attractive, laughs easily, has an endearing accent, oh, and makes a delicious variety of wine, you will enjoy today's interview with Anna Giogo Draper of Artessa Estate Vineyards and Winery. They're located on the southern end of Napa Valley at the base of Mount Veter in the Carneros AVA. Although Ana is Portuguese, Artesa is owned by Cordonu Reventos, a Spanish company, the oldest wine company in Europe. So between the company's past and their current location, Ana crafts a good variety of wines found in both regions. They like to say Artesa was born in Barcelona, raised in Napa Valley. (laughs) <laughs> we had a fun time together, chatting and tasting, and time flew by. So, Anna was the sole guest on my radio show. When we met up, she was pointing out a variety of places we could record in their strikingly designed tasting spaces, which we'll talk about later. So, while guests were enjoying their visit, we were off to the side recording the interview and tasting some of her wine. I turned on the mic just as we began to talk about her Albarino and her new tanks. So this year we've got um, concrete tanks right before harvest. We purchased three concrete tanks, Except different sizes. Model. We got a square model and we got these two little barrels. They're called new barrels and they're equivalent to four barrels worth of wine. So 240 gallons, so very small. Um, and there's a particular block on the property that always um, shows just beautiful elegance and a really nice delicate fruit and floral profile. And then my gut said that that particular block in concrete would show beautifully, and it showed so incredible that I convinced the upper po- higher powers <laughs> to bottle it as an estate, an estate bottling. Well, so it's nice to have that, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's fantastic. It hasn't been released yet. It's still kind of aging in bottle for a few more months, but that one is 100% concrete fermented. And then in the, those Carneros there were tasting... This one is um, 40% concrete, and then the remaining 60%, 58% tank, and then we do 2% in a neutral 500-liter pungent barrel. The floral characters are just jumping out of this glass. It's it's really really unique. And I really give that to the concrete. Um, It just ferments very slowly, so I think you can really um, work on those aromatic compounds. I ferment very, very low temperature, all our whites, particularly with, um, with the Albarino. And we pick early, low alcohol. It's very important to my Portuguese heritage to not do a very big, robust Albarino. I want to be very truthful, but knowing, obviously, that we're not in Portugal or Spain. We are in California, mm-hmm. but I think Carneros has the perfect conditions to grow worldwide quality Albarino. I seem to remember, and I could be wrong, that Albarino has also some stone fruit quality to it, and and the, I think the ones I've had don't have quite this much of a floral note to it. Yeah, this, I think the later you pick, the more, and it's also how you manipulate the fermentation. You ferment a little warmer, if you pick a little on the riper side, I think you get more of that stone fruit. My goal here is that floral aspect and that very kind of lime, lemon curd. And then I do those 2% in oak to kind of just round the back palate a little bit because there's no malolactic, it's crisp, it's kind of that tightness and tension, and then just to round the back palate a little bit. Yeah, so this just got released a week ago, I think. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. You know, I'm stepping back to your cava here because when we were first talking and I first arrived, uh, there was a certain note that's just jumping out of this, and I can't quite put my tongue on it and part of the reason I think is I had to have a throat lozenge on the way over here because I'm still battling this darn cold that's been so I know that's knocked my tongue off a little bit so what is it that I'm picking is it kind of a a minty flavor um 
I get kind of uh, maybe a little bit of a mint leaf, eucalyptus, not so much. There's some toasted brioche for me, that kind of vanilla, toasted vanilla, mm, maybe but that a little bit of that yeasty character. Um, yeah. yeah, a little bit yeasty. Yeah, it's this, this it's a is nice flavor. Barrel in tank fermented. Um, it's 100% estate. It's vintage designated. So it's grown and produced at Artes. So we do tourage here. So we involved in the whole product. What's, what's the grape varietal? So it's 50% Pinot, 50% Chardonnay. So okay. it's a blend. And we also have a rosé that's 100% Pinot. And next vintage, we'll disgorge our first late disgorge that would have spent five years on East. This one spends our brood, spends about three years on East before... before. So do you call it a cava or no? We, we can't. Right, yeah, I think so. <laughs> we call it a sparkling, but the cava is done with classic champagnois method, but um, I definitely go, go back having the legacy of obviously 500 years of the Codar New family and being part of a group. We do uh, winemaker meetings every year, taste each other's wines, have trials that are done here, replicated in Spain. And Coder New was very known for their research efforts and being very innovators, and I think to this day we try to be faithful to that as, as a company still, so kind of grow on that legacy. And so we keep pushing the envelope and doing trials, and to that extent in 2000. 16, that sparkling has a, had a big change for me and started being 100% stainless huh. and no ML. So very crisp, yeah. kind of a transition from more of this more classic sparkling, barrel fermented. So there's kind of a, a shift there on the, on the brute and on that late scorch wine. I like the flavor, though, and it Thank does you. have quite a bit of flavor to yeah, it. Yeah, it is very flavorful, yeah. That's Definitely. one of my problems with Brut and sparkling wine is I don't really get, I mean, you get the normal toast and that sort of thing, but I don't get a whole lot of flavor. I just get bubbles on my tongue. Well, acid is very important, natural acid, but you, you need acid and fruit to balance each other. Um, and I think that's what the family saw when they purchased the property initially with the intention to make world-class sparklings, to make just sparkling. But then they realized the quality of the property and the quality of the fruit coming out of the property and decided to focus on production of yeah. high-quality Chardonnay and Pinot. But I do think Carneros, there's no coincidence that so many sparkling houses produce fruit or that Chardonnay and Pinot all come from here. The proximity to the bay, the, the breeze that comes in the afternoon, we're just able to extend our growing season but still maintain really incredible acidity, natural acidity and minerality in the grapes. Yeah. Yeah. You've touched upon it a little bit, but um, Artesa is owned by the Cordonu Raventos, which goes back to the 1500s. And they were, from what I understand, they were one of the creators of cava. Yes, so um, they were one of the original f- families producing cava in Spain. Um, it's kind of... To touch on that innovation, um, Manuel Raventos was, was the one that really pushed impulse cava. His father on his deathbed made him promise that he would never do it. And as a young man, what do you do? You go against <laughs> your father's wishes. Even if it's on the deathbed, that's a tough... <laughs> Rev- revolutionize and really push forward with the, with the production of cava. Um, they were also the first ones to produce cava out of Chardonnay. I mean, they still produce, obviously, cava out of um, the parrillada, out of the, all the traditional, um, and the charelo macabeo trio of varietals for cava. But they really pushed the envelope, and they produced a sparkling called, or a cava called uh, Ana de Codorniu, also one, one of the most famous women in the family that really re- revolutionized the, her time. Uh, and that one's based, Chardonnay-based, and that was not seen in Spain until until then. But... It's it's amazing, the history, the legacy. I keep finding things all the time. I mean, it's the 17th generation that's still on, on the that's, company. Yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around it. The oldest company in Spain, not just in the wine industry, but they're the oldest family-owned um, company altogether. And they have some of the oldest wineries, too, in like Rioja and Bodega and yes, Balbainas. And and Balbainas in Rioja, Ligaris in Ribera del Duero. Ray Matt, which is uh, obviously in Codorniu in, in, um, in San Salorni, and then in the same, in the Penedes region, a little higher in Catalonia, um, also Ray Matt, uh, Ray Matt Winery, um, and then Artesa, which was the first winery they purchased outside of Spain, and um, a winery also um, Septima in Argentina in Mendoza. Yeah. 
And the largest single vineyard in all of Europe, too. Is Raymat, yes. It's the largest single vineyard in, in, in Europe. It's fantastic, too. How many hectares or acres? I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> it's probably just continually growing, isn't it? Yes, yes. And I know that the... I can't imagine, because we have, you know, we manage and grow 150 acres here, and I feel that's half of my job. <laughs> we have a wonderful grow relations and vineyard manager, but we work very closely t- together. But that's to sizable. manage a vineyard that size, I can't. I can't. I can't imagine. I know it's the biggest continuous vineyard in, in Europe, yeah. Imagine that, the largest vineyard in all of Europe. Out of curiosity, I looked up Raymat online, and under vineyards, they mentioned three, Conca de Barbera, Costa del Sagra, and Penedes. That one alone is 27,500 hectares. That's just under 68,000 acres. To put it in perspective, that's four square miles larger than the entire area of Sacramento. Yeah, that's a lot to manage. Getting back to the wine, at this point, we moved on to her palate-pleasing Pinot Noir. The second wine is our Pinot Noir. So um, the one we're trying today is our 16, is our state vineyard. So comes from different blocks um, on the property, 100% estate, different clones, uh, Verdijon, Martini based. 16 is 100% native fermented. So no, inocul- not inoculated with any commercial yeasts. And then about 30% is fermented in pungent barrels. So 500 liter barrels that we pop out the barrel heads and ferment directly into those pungents. Oh, nice. So we get a lot of kind of textural components, yeah. um, but still maintaining that delicate. And then we age that wine in those same pungents we fermented. So it's right. almost like we're seasoning the oak in a way, and especially with Pinot Noir from Carneros, which is fruit that's very delicate, Pinot that really needs to be um, very ca- careful with the, with the oak, oak choices. Um, and then the rest is fermented in op- small open top um, fermenters, five day cold soak, um, and then ages in 100% in oak. We only use about 30% new oak for about 12 months and then, and then bottle. So it really shows our, our soils are very, very shallow, very gravelly. We have a combination of limestone, sandstone, um, a lot of ridges, a lot of, I call our property and accordion <laughs> there's just a lot of slopes and so a lot of variability within flavor profiles within the blocks but um it's very el- it's a powerful con- elegance i call it or a concentrated elegance it's powerful but very elegant yeah. at the same time. like a strong woman <laughs> yeah that's a good one <laughs> i found her pinot to be soft initially then as it glided over my tongue i detected some light tannins and i also picked up some earthy characteristics mid-palate but overall, still a good amount of fruit. Yeah, it's very fruity. I feel um, the goal for me with this wine is to be very hands off. So I really want to showcase our unique terroir that we have on the property, these different blocks. I break down blocks and ferment them separately yeah, because we have the, such variability. Sometimes within the block, we have different exposures, different soil profiles. Uh, I can have you know, more sandstone on this side and then here all, all gravel on the other side of the same block. So they're picked and fermented and aged separately and then kind of just gives us the ability, makes it wine making more challenging but more fun. I was going to say that's why you're so busy because you're yeah, breaking everything down in separate blocks like and yeah. fermenting separately. Absolutely. And you go up into the Mount Buter foothills. We do. And then do. down into Carneros. Yeah, so we all within the Napa Valley Carneros EVA, but um, some of our blocks are above 400 feet of elevation, which is considered uh, Mount Vitor. Uh, so on the, those higher ridges, we just planted um, Cabernet and Tempranillo that we will harvest for the first time this year. So we're very, very excited. Up on the higher ridges. Up on the higher ridges. So it's warm enough for those varieties. It's warm enough, yeah, we're hoping. Yeah, we got, obviously, we had to study the clones, and we got clones that are early ripening, um, Cabernet clones. They're still behind, but they're very comparable. We were just in Atlas Peak to what we're seeing in Atlas Peak currently, so kind of that more mountain fruit character. We're, you know, we're nervous, but we're very anxious and very excited, and... Um, I feel um, Carneros has the potential to grow incredible range of varietals that surpasses way more than Pinot Noir and, and, and Chardonnay. It's funny to hear a winemaker say, we're hopeful. <laughs> because you're talking about several years of experimentation. Yes, absolutely. Well, 
we started small um, and then we you know we did our own work our research but we believe that the quality is there and we believe that all the conditions the soil the the exposure everything is there to grow top class cabernet so. that's where your experience comes in yes exactly you're exactly. rolling the dice but you're pretty confident yeah i'm very very confident yeah if we weren't we would never have rolled the dice like that obviously on the property but we're, we're very the, the the location of those of, of those blocks, I think, has everything to to be very successful as far as quality goes. Yeah, because this is all very close, as you mentioned. I mean, some of it's across the road down yes. down below, yes. but you're growing Tempranillo and Cabernet, and Albarino and Chardonnay. Yeah, so we main focus is Pinot Noir, so that's uh, our main. Um, the main volume, it's right in the middle. Um, and then we have some Chardonnay, uh, Tempranillo. We, we at our first block of Tempranillo um, harvested uh, this year. And Albarino we've had on the property for, for a long time. We're actually planting a little more with the goal to really make our Albarino 100% um, estate. And it's such a successful program in our in our visitor center in our tasting room that it's a program we've always been asked to to grow and now doing that estate Albarino I we only did a hundred cases this year but it's a program that I I'm a believer and I'd love to see it Continue. see it grow yeah 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 for sure do you bottle uh, at least 75% or more of Tempranillo by itself? Because I see we have a Tempranillo Cabernet blend here. We do several Tempranillo. the three different Tempranillo-based wines at Artesa. We make one that's 100% Tempranillo. We make a blend called Tradicio that we blend with a little bit of um, Garnacha. Garnacha Negra we get from Sonoma County. Um, but it's Tempranillo-based. But we source fruit from Sonoma County. Napa County, and now from Napa County Estate. We get from Atlas Peak, from Calistoga. So if there's Tempranillo in Napa, we're getting it. <laughs> and when you get the Garnacha, do they call it Garnacha or Grenache? Uh, Grenache, but we, we call it Garnacha, yes. <laughs> I love Grenache, too. It's like Grenache is really, really beautiful. It's very unique. It's black Grenache. Uh, I mean, these clusters are just super intensified. We played a little bit with the concrete fermentations in Grenache this year, too, and I'm very excited with, with the, the direction of, of, of that wine. And then this one we have in front of us, it's called Galatea, which was our project of redeveloping and redoing this incredible tasting room we're sitting in. Um, and Susan and I, our president, wanted to create a blend that connected our Spanish heritage with our Napa Valley roots, so really Perfect. combine the two worlds. So obviously the two, Tempranillo and Cabernet, are the two queen varietals of, of each region, and we thought, could they be blended together? And we thought, well, it's a crazy idea. We sat down and over a blending session came up with, with this blend, and I love, you get the aromatics of the Tempranillo, but then, you know, Tempranillo can be tight and those tannins can be big, and then the Cabernet really softens the back palate. I think it's a perfect blend. It ages in bottle for two years before release. So it's kind of, we do it, I think, kind of a Ribera del Duero style, but then like a, a, a pure reserva as two, two years of uh, bottle aging before we release it. It's delicious. Yeah, they, they go very well together. Yeah, yeah, they, they really do. It's kind of this symbiosis and, you know, it's like a lot of blends start, I guess. You just this idea that starts growing and then uh, it was really fun to sit on the blending table and... Um, 13 was the first vintage, and we've been uh, we've been doing it ever since. And this is just a 14, so do you it's age it for a, a while? 14. We have 15, 16, okay. aging in bottle. Uh, the 15 will be released in the fall, right. and then we're getting ready to blend the, the 17. Aren't you happy to be here in the U.S. where you can put some crazy blends like that Absolutely. together? Well, Portugal, you can be, you know, there's so many varietals. Oh, yeah. You can be so, you know, it can be very inventive and very, very original, really push the envelope there. And do they have that ability in Spain as well? I think there's more, in Europe, there's more restrictions. I yeah. think the, the beauty of, of California and of the U.S. is you have a lot more freedom to play and play with um, blending fruit from different regions. For instance, this... Galatea 14 has Napa and Sonoma County uh, friends fruit blended. I think in Rioja or in other regions, I know they, in Cava they have the Dio Cava. There's all these entities that control. There's much more control that we have here. I mean, we have control, but we also have, there's more creative freedom, if, if I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's much more creative freedom here, for sure. 
And she has a big smile on her face as she says that. <laughs> I'd love to go. I spent a month in, in Portugal last summer. I went to the Douro, spent a week there, and then I went back to the Alentejo in the south where I studied, and I have friends that make wine. I really reconnected to that wine side that I kind of lost track. I would love to make wine there one day. I, I think it would be fun or if some sort of, I don't know, something. I, there's so much you can do too. And I feel like it's, Portugal is really coming, the wines of Portugal are coming in the map. And I think they're evolving now and find, there was to be, I think there was a very traditional approach. And I think they're starting to think outside the box and thinking of new things too. Yeah, they're definitely getting more international for attention. Sure, for sure. I mean, it's, it's the best price quality you can find in the market, if, I'm, if I may say so. <laughs> you can find wines for $10, $15 at the quality. It's absolutely incredible, yeah. yeah. Well, if you factor in the low price of wine, that might make a trip to Portugal a little more affordable. It's a country that's definitely on our travel list. Typically, I don't taste during interviews, but Anna was so gracious, she had a tasting set up when I arrived. Now, if wine is offered, I won't turn it down. And, you know, I didn't want her sparkling in Albarino to get warm, so I had no choice but to jump in. In the last segment, she mentioned the Galatea, a Tempranillo and Cabernet Sauvignon blend, the wine that best represents a Spanish company with a winery in Napa Valley. I took a break from the interview to taste it and was not surprised at how much I enjoyed it. Here's Anna talking about the need for extra aging on the blend. And it's a very big wine. It really needs that bottle aging. I mean, this wine, when it, you know, when we blend it, as soon as we bottle, it's just, you know, it's just, it's big. It's kind of disjointed. It really needs that. I, that was the first thing I said when we made it: is it needs bottle time. It can't be a wine. Sometimes in California, we tend to release our wines early, but that, that I think that bottle aging is fundamental for us. As a 14, it seems like it's definitely ready now because yeah. it's, oh, yeah, yeah. it's not overpowering at all. It's not too tannic. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's so beautiful. The goal is that when we release it, the wine is, you know, you can age this wine for a long time, but at the same time, if you want to enjoy it now, it's absolutely ready to, to, be, to be enjoyed. You mentioned earlier that you've been working with other winemakers in the uh, group of wineries around the world. And, yeah, that must be very enlightening, and you're doing trials with them. And, and I even saw that it's referred to as the Global Warming Group. Are you already working around that trend of the, the Earth getting a little bit warmer? We're very conscious about it. I mean, and being in Carneros, you know, we're, we're reliant on, you know, the fog that comes in in the morning and then the wind in the afternoon. I mean... That's what makes Carneros what, you know, what it is. Um, we're very conscious with water usage, obviously. The drought affects us like everyone else in the valley. Um, ecologically also with, you know, use of cover crops. Um, we've used before and we stopped, and I think we're going to do for grazing, bring sheep back to the property. Oh, uh, we've done that for a few years, and we stopped, and I think we're looking. So um, we're green certified by the Napa Valley Vintners. Um, and we're really looking, we've looked into even conversion of the vineyards to eventually um, organic, which in color new in Spain is something, I know Raymat is 100% organically certified, the biggest vineyard in Europe. So it's, um, that focus is very big in, in color new, but it's fascinating. The, the, we do tr trials that, you know, East trials, I do a lot of no sulfur wines now that I had no sulfur at the crusher. That started from a trial that, in one of my visits, we tasted, and it's fun to uh, replicate a Tempranillo trial here and in Rioja and then sit together and taste. So we meet for about a week every year and kind of taste each other's trials, do a fun trip to a wine region, or really kind of learn more and then change ideas throughout the year. During harvest, call each other, uh, and it's, it's very collaborative. Uh, here, I think it's more common that people collaborate in Europe is it's it's more rare I think to find to find to have that kind of attitude people tend to be a little more secretive so I think it's very f freeing especially for the winemakers in Europe to have that kind of playground and to be able to shoot ideas back and forward well and easy too when you're owned by the same company absolutely absolutely there's not that secrecy or uh, and then to collaborate with, with different wines and um, our director of winemaking comes we have a director of winemaking for the whole um, company Diego we used to be the winemaker for um, Bodegas Bombainas, and he's very young and uh, just inventive and full of ideas, and it's very fun. He comes out a few times a year to collaborate and, and work with them. 
So does Cornu know that you're Portuguese and not Spanish? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's actually a joke between between all of us. Um, but there's we we joke a lot with all of that because there's you know there's Spanish from Rioja, there's Catalans, there's Portuguese, so um, Argentinian, so culturally very diverse, and we all um, we all joke fiercely about it with each other. It's it's pretty fun. <laughs> I've been having a bit of fun with her too. I don't know if you noticed, but I've referred to her today as Anna and Anna. I've known a few Annas over the years who were Hispanic, and I believe it's Anna in Portuguese as well, but Anna has anglicized her name. I asked her about that, and she's fine with it either way, so I used both. If you happen to see Amy Poehler's nutty movie about wine country on Netflix, you got a chance to see the lawn, ponds, and sculptures at Artessa, behind all the madness that was going on with the actresses. If you haven't been to Artessa, it is quite a sight high atop a hill, surrounded by vineyards. As you enter, they have a wide open space that features many of the gifts you can buy, and your eyes will be immediately drawn to the tiles they've incorporated during their recent renovation. Those tap into the Spanish style. That leads to a very comfortable tasting room with a round bar and a couch and chair seating area. There are also rooms for elevated tasting experiences. The outdoor patio shows an expansive view of the Los Carneros wine region, the San Pablo Bay, and on a clear day, San Francisco. Below all of that, underground, is the wine production space and barrel rooms. So we're basically an inverted pyramid inside the mountain. So we have a natural grass roof, uh, which, I mean, we built in the 80s. It was very, very inventive for the time. It's naturally temperature-controlled. Um, but also the goal of the, the architect and the, that came then to, to design the winery and build the winery, he is from Catalonia, he built a few of the wineries in Spain, and then I think his vision was something, he wanted something that was very organic. Something, I mean, you have, if you come here, you'll see this absolutely gorgeous, breathtaking nature surrounded you. He didn't want a big building to overstate that. He wanted to be within, within nature, and I think he achieved that to perfection. Obviously, you have the views, and then the winery, really, we went through this remodeling not only with the tasting room, but also with, with our wines and with our label and um, just kind of this vision for the winery. And we really wanted to bring this kind of um, born in Barcelona, raised in Napa Valley motto. So we wanted to tie in our Spanish heritage. So there's a lot of tile. We build our logo in the tile, this beautiful hydraulic tile that we brought from Spain, from Barcelona here, and just have this very organic and very, um, I think, almost like a you were, you were in a tapas bar in Catalonia. There's the bar, uh, you know. There's just these places to hang out and just to be, to be very elegant, very organic, but also very friendly and warming and welcoming. We wanted that kind of hospitality to point to be to be present, uh, and I think it was really well achieved, yeah. I would say so. I would think if you brought anybody in here and they didn't have any idea of your background, they'd be like, wow, this is unique. This tile is kind of interesting. But if you said it's Spanish, then, yeah. then it would click. You'd be like, oh, of course. Okay, I can see that now. The paintings, the, the, the tile work. And uh, now that you mention it, I, I would love to have some tapas to go with these wines. <laughs> <laughs> I should have thought of that, sorry. <laughs> you do uh, food and wine pairings here, don't you? We do. We do really interesting different food and wine pairings. We do a tapas uh, pro food and wine pairing. We do a pinchos. That's a traditional Catalan tapa. We do a vino con queso, a wine and cheese. My favorite, that's an aromatic white uh, flight of wines that we pair with caviar mm. and potato chips, which is just amazing. We do a wine and chocolate, so that focus, and we do the pinchos and the tapas, they're seasonal, so they change throughout, throughout the year, depending on the season. Um, so we've really focused on that, on, on those type of programs. We do also groups and meetings, and but that, that, that focus on the, the, the food and wine pairings, we put, I've worked really closely with our tasting room manager and with our VC staff to really make it just the pairings to be very harmonious and, and they're very interesting. That's the thing about being a director of winemaking. Your responsibility is the things that you touch are on every level about it. 
It's a lot, huh? You, the pressure, <laughs> if you put it like that. <laughs> Thank goodness you only have 150 acres. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we farm, we farm, uh, uh, we actually get fruit from a lot of different, we make 28 different wines at Artessa. So we, Ariane's are really, I mean, our focus is obviously on um, Pinot and Chardonnay, but we also have a, a very large wine club. And so we really cater to them and to these wines that they really love. We do single vineyard blocks from the property, and as we're now starting to redevelop the estate vineyard, because it's now a 30-year-old vineyard, so little by little we're developing. And as we do, we're starting to come up with new bottlings, and we really want our focus to be more on our estate wines and on the property, something like the Alberino, new estate Pinot Noirs, and possibly Chardonnays in the future. So, On your website, I saw... Uh use diverse clones that demand micro farming so I was wondering if you consider yourself a micromanager absolutely not <laughs> no not at all no I'm micromanaging of the lots but not of my team I have a wonderful team that works with me I trust them completely to be able to have my hands on all these different things I'm a little bit a type attention but I trust my team and to be able to have, wear so many hats, you really have to be able to delegate and trust your team. And I'm very lucky. And, and that's, I think, the part to me that really drew me to winemaking is the teamwork and how everyone works together to make this just one amazing product. It comes through harvest, but it's got to go throughout the whole year. I mean, harvest, I think that's that partnership and that group work is enhanced, but um, just working as a team is something I, I, I truly enjoy. It's nice to have people you can rely on. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. fundamental, I'd say, yeah, to absolutely. be successful and to make, to make great wines, yeah. We've touched upon the fact that Anna is Portuguese, and although they primarily grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, as well as Cabernet Sauvignon, they also have Spanish varieties like Albarino and Tempranillo. So with her background, it seemed natural to ask if there are any plans to plant Portuguese varieties. Well, no, there's no, no plans. I'd love to make some Turiga. I've been throwing that around for years. One of my favorite, yeah, I love Turiga Nacional. It's one of my favorite varietals. Um, so we found a block a few years back, and I kind of threw it around. But I think we need to stay focused. <laughs> oh, yeah, and also, that. winemakers will lose track. Oh, let's make this, let's make that. Um, not in the immediate, no, no. It would be fun, but no. <laughs> One thing I haven't asked you yet is tell me about your childhood in Portugal. Did I read that you have a connection to agriculture? Well, my grandfather, I, I was born very urbanly, but with family uh, in the countryside. Yeah, my grandfather was kind of a magician, vineyard grafter, grafted vineyards, travel all over. Um, and then we had friends with... Um, with vineyard, we would sometimes go and help with harvest, but not very connected directly to to farming. And then agriculture, in other ways, we had family that own um, cork forests, and so there was always agriculture in in the background. I studied agriculture engineering because I did not know. I knew I wanted to be related to agriculture, but I haven't had that calling of being a winemaker since I was since I was little. Wine was always at our table, you know. Europe is just a cultural thing. We always, my parents, my parents always, you know, enjoyed a glass of wine in their meal, and we always drank nice wines and talk about it. There was a culture. Um, and then in university, I was very lucky. One of my professors is one of the biggest winemakers in Portugal, and he was very practical. He didn't have that, you know, university approach to winemaking. On my first winemaking class, I took. And kind of, I was hooked. By the end of the semester, I said, I think I want to do this. And I just loved, I don't know, the alchemy of turning grapes into wine, the blending aspect of it all. Um, we kind of had a little bit of all of that and then decided to do a harvest because that's what he told me is what I tell everybody that comes to me saying, I want to be a winemaker. You got to work harvest one year. And you find right away, if you love it, then it's for you. If you don't like it, don't do it because you're committing to it for 30 plus years of your life <laughs> it will be there every year uh, and I love that I was hooked I, again I love the fast pace the smells the teamwork I absolutely loved it I still do it's kind of amazing after all these years 
um, yeah, and then just kind of decided and went through that route with my school and my thesis and did the research, worked research in the university a little bit too, yeah. And aside from the, the scientific alchemy of it, it's also very artistic. Super artistic. All winemakers are frustrated artists, I say that yeah. a lot of times. <laughs> so you're in a perfect place because this is so artistic. You have the yeah. sculptures outside, the, yeah. the, the uh, reflective ponds and all the artwork in here. Yeah, so you, it's very peaceful. It's absolutely, yeah. That's, there's, it's a control artistry because you have the, part, the scientific part and then the blending, which is, I think, it's the, every, every winemaker will say it's just, oh, yeah. just amazing to sit down and see these blends, these wines come together. Uh, and make the winemaking itself, making the wines. I'm always making up things as I go. Fruit comes in, I just got an idea. And my team will be like, oh, you're killing us. <laughs> so that artistry with science, I always love science. I always love art. So it's just, it really is the perfect the perfect job for me. <laughs> I to say, you look very happy and you must love it here. Absolutely. I, I do. I, I love, I believe so much in our project and the wines we're making here, working for this incredible company, everything, um, and then just making wine. I mean, who could be sad for having a job that, what do you make? I'm a winemaker. It's, just, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time and I, I imagine you appreciate having a break. Absolutely. It's fun to sit here, <laughs> taste some wines. and. Are you, are you happy with your work? I am. As we taste your wines? Yeah, I'm, I am. I'm very happy. Yeah. And to see how they evolve, you know, we always, winemakers will always joke, you know, we only have so many shots in our career because you have one shot a year. And my goal is to learn from the past vintage and then have ideas, what can I do different and, 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 and evolve and never to settle for what you do, but always wanting to, to be better and improve. It's always a learning experience, Absolutely. but um, you're doing it well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Giogo Draper of Artessa Vineyards and Winery. I hope you found her as delightful to listen to as I did interviewing her. If you live near or are traveling to Northern California, do yourself a favor and visit Artessa if you haven't already. As you've heard, there's plenty to experience there. Learn more at artessawinery.com. Thanks so much to Anna for spending so much time with me that day. It was a real pleasure. Remember, you can find more interviews at OnTheWineRoad.com and more on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at J.D. Wine Road. Thanks for coming along with me on The Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis. Jeff Davis.